the passage I choose as an epigraph for today is taken from the book of Job, Job 12, verses 11 to 13. Does not the ear test words as the tongue tests foods? Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. NIV translation. Quoting from human discourses in the book of Job is seldom entirely safe. Eliphaz, so far, Bildad, as you know, did not pass their examinations with very high grades. <laughs> and even if the statement is Job's, as is the case with what I just read, we remember that he repented uh, on dust and ashes. <laughs> His reference to wisdom found among the aged I don't pretend that it applies to my own case. <laughs> I chose the passage hoping that you would accept to understand this is accommodation. Old men, as if Job had said men of old. <laughs> Whether they were giants or not, and many were, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors we have a chance to see matters more clearly if we expose ourselves to the fruit of their gifts and their labors, and if we learn also from their mistakes. This is why this first lecture this afternoon is devoted to a review of what thinkers of the past have said on the topic of possibility. We need help. Though basic, the idea, as I emphasized in the first lecture, is not crystal clear. Several dictionaries of philosophy do acknowledge its composite character. And I mentioned that Leibniz has himself pointed to the difficulty of the subject. I read now the full quote. It is from the New Essays on Human Understanding, which he didn't publish in his life. It was published several decades after his death. He had left it in, in manuscript form. He uh, writes in that work the ideas of being, the possible, sameness, are so innate that they enter in all our thoughts and reasonings. And I consider themselves uh, I consider them to be essential to our minds. But, as I already said, they do not always receive the particular attention they deserve. And time is needed to sort them out. So we are taking that time this afternoon. We know that though there may be wisdom in the men of old, Still, wisdom and understanding belong to the Lord, as the text we have read stresses. So we do our, this work already with the biblical perspective in mind, which we shall try to develop in the second period. I entertain no ambition of an exhausting survey. We shall proceed half chronologically, half topically, selecting thinkers that have made a contribution, to my knowledge at least, relevant to our quest. And for some of them, I don't hide it, I rely mostly on secondary sources. Several of them we already mentioned in the first lecture, but the angle is not the same. In the first lecture, I was looking for examples of the use of possibility to account for evil. And today, we try to ascertain their understanding of possibility itself. I leave out possibility in the sense of our simple ignorance. 
uh, I mentioned already that this is not really interesting uh, for our subject. Here are my headings. Mater Materia, Divine Freedom and Human Frailty. Third, Freedom and the Bounds of Reason. I could have added the Bound of Reasons alone. And finally, just a few glances, but some new comments from the last 20th century, possible and nothingness. These are the parts of the survey I'm undertaking. Mater, materia, mother, matter. I'm told, I read, that there is a quite far away, but uh, a etymological connection between the two. And I take it again as an illustration and a symbol. The first major system in which possibility occupies a strategic location is that of Aristotle, as I already uh, said. Uh, we find developments on the topic in the physics and the metaphysics of the books of Aristotle. And apart from the possibility of accidents, chance happenings due to the resistance of matter, dynamis, in the passive sense of potentiality, passive power, is a key term in the first main ontological pair of Aristotle's system, possibility, potentia, dynamis in his own tongue, and act, energia, entelechia uh, in his Greek. Two models govern Aristotle's approach in general, and this has been noticed by many interpreters. The biological model, that of growth from germinal to fulfilled state, adult state, and the model of human crafts or arts, not only fine arts, but they are also included. Uh, human craft implies a process that leads to the production of an object. Being human is potentially dynamite in the embryo or in the little child. And it is in act, energia and telegia, this is the goal reached in the grown up person. See, see how the two concepts are used. Similarly, the bed is potentially in the wood that has been cut in the forest, cut down in the forest. But in act, actually, uh, it is the bed which the joiner's work has realized. Or if you think of fine arts, Hermes is potentially in the trunk of the marble block and actually uh, in the statue when it is finished. These are typical examples in Aristotle's treatment. In this way, Aristotle feels that he is able to explain the movement from one stage to the other. The word movement, under his pen, uh, having a very broad meaning, it means every kind of change. It's not only local movement, but any change of state he uses also another word with similar meaning. And he can write, since being is double, uh, he uses the adjective diton, on being is double diton, maybe we could translate twofold or dipolar. <laughs> uh, since being is double, everything changes from being potentially to being actually. This is a, a quotation. He defines movement or change as the actualization of the possible as such. And this is a famous statement by his. And he can define what is possible 
as that for which there is no impossibility, this is his, his own expression, that what is potentially there uh, reaches the state uh, of actualization. There is possibility when this uh, move is uh, not hindered by some other factor that makes it impossible. <laughs> In a many, many passages, though not all, the pair act power or potens potentia coincide with the other one, form matter. The, comp the two components are often united with the name hylemorphism to describe Aristotle's system. Matter is potentiality. It is defined as undefinable because it can receive all forms. It is pure potentiality. And the movement from that potentiality to actuality is described as desire. Aristotle wrote that matter desires form, matter potentiality, desires form as the female desires the male. That is his own comparison. He says also as ugliness desires beauty. Form or act moves through the attraction of its purity. And God is the unmoved mover as pure act, pure form, without any mixture of potentiality, without any mixture of matter. God moves everything without even knowing the world. For this would imply some potentiality. God does not know the world, actus purus, but he is the object of desire through its very purity. He moves everything as eromenon, he writes, the verb from which eros is derived, or is the, the corresponding name. The, the Aristotelian God, one or many, this is a point of dispute <laughs> among uh, Aristotelian interpreters, moves in that way through the attraction of its purity. In itself, it is thought of thought, <laughs> self-thinking, <laughs> noeseos. Uh, uh, this is his definition because then you have pure transparency, pure actuality, uh, and uh, so such a beauty, a beauty that it attracts every uh, other being which is mixed with matter or potentiality. This analysis is the heart of Aristotle's project, and I think we should understand how he came to it, what why it was so important in his eyes. He inherited from Plato, whose assistant he was during 20 years. He was first a student and then assistant. He inherited from Plato the marvelous discovery of intelligible forms. Mark Sheringham, who taught in France, but I think now he has a chair in philosophy somewhere in the States, in his book on the philosophy uh, of aesthetics uh, refers perceptively to the, the joy of definition. Out of the confusion of sensations of all kind, everything in flux, as Heraclitus had said, at, the, at last, fixed points, clear indicators, stars which can guide us in our sail, yardsticks, criteria through which we can think. See, this is the discovery. And this Aristotle inherits from Plato, the liberating uh, doctrine of ideas, that is, intelligible forms. But some elements of Plato's still evolving theory bother Aristotle. There is, in Plato, the flight away from the earthly scene, 
which is quite characteristic. In a famous painting by Ingres, the Apotheosis of Homer, Plato is represented with his finger pointing heavenwards. <laughs> and Aristotle, <laughs> down to the earth. <laughs> this is typical. Uh, Aristotle had a solid sense and taste for elementary reality. There was too much poetry for him in Plato, despite Plato's negative comments on poets. He was also, Aristotle, dissatisfied with Plato's recourse to another principle than being. Non-being becomes a second principle that mixes with being in concrete things, according to, to Plato. And this is not satisfactory in Aristotle's eyes. This is why he thinks he has the, the solution with potentiality as a mode of being, but included in being as another pole compared with, with act. But it is entirely relative to act. And he feels that he has domesticated change in this way. What a feat. <laughs> Yet Aristotle's achievement is not free from difficulties. And this was already perceived by some uh, in ancient times. His definition of uh, movement as the possible, as, as the act of the possible, as possible, is paradoxical. For possible and act are precisely the two mutually exclusive modes. So how can you have the, the act of the possible and the possible? This suggests circularity. Worse, maybe, the old dualism, which was so worrisome in Plato, being, non-being, is still there. Now, it is claimed that it is within being that you distinguish these two grades, but whence does this duality uh, this diton uh, word that he uses come from. Doyeville's analysis shows that the f uh, this duality comes from the duality of religious influences that shaped uh, Greek thought, the duality of the old Ktonic religion uh, of which Dionysos, Dionysos was also a, a figure in, in the mother, mother Earth. And then the other religious formation of the Olympic gods uh, with uh, the heavenly regularity. This duality is reflected in that duality of act and potentiality matter. And when Aristotle ascribes desire to matter, well, we must say he refers to mythology. Uh, clearly so, we hear an echo of the litanies of the old mother earth, mater materia. This is why I showed that, the subheadings. Even worse, maybe, the ambiguous equivalence of the two pairs, form, matter, and act power, might be, I suggest, this is more or less my suggestion, the secret pseudos of the enterprise. What does it imply? It implies the confidence that Aristotle can explain all becoming on the basis of the constitution of concrete being. It means that the world becomes self-explaining in his system. And in biblical perspective, we may say that's it, the lie underlying <laughs> what uh, Aristotle has, has built. A self-explaining world is uh, an ultimate. Uh, it's alpha and omega. Aristotle's legacy was taken over, as I said on the first lecture by Plotinus, with some corrections. Uh, I jump above this uh, assumption uh, and, and development by Plotinus to uh, start on my second uh, section, 
divine freedom and human frailty. While Plotinus were, was reorganizing the heritage of the Greek miracle, as Renan called the, the development of philosophy, the birth and the development of philosophy in Greece, uh, while Plotinus was responsible for the autumn of pagan thought, Christianity broke through. And it slowly learned enough conceptual refinements to express in a new way the contents of the faith, of the faith once delivered to the saints. At first, the conquest and subduing of Greek intellectual tools was rudimentary and awkward. I would say second century, this is quite uh, obvious. But soon signs were there of a philosophical, theological, no separation, philosophical, theological revolution. And it reached full bloom in the work of that great genius of human history, Augustine. Gilson, Etienne Gilson, once compared the, the work of Augustine, the, the, the whole of his writings, to a former pagan temple which had been transferred to Christian worship, as was the case of a number of, of buildings in, in those times, with a Christian altar in the middle. A pagan temple with a Christian altar. This is the, the philosophy, theology of Augustine. And indeed, St. Augustine retains a huge amount of the non-Christian heritage, especially Neoplatonic. But we should not minimize the recasting that the Christian insertion entailed, and a few indications about this. The obvious collision with the pagan view, always implicitly polytheistic and pantheistic, was the effect of the confession of the one living God, creator of all, the father almighty of the creed. The freedom of that God exploded the old world view. And a symbol of the change before Augustine may be mentioned. For the old Greeks, as you know, the circular root of the stars, its perfect regularity, was the very proof of their divine status. And now, Lactantius, who was no daring theologian, <laughs> yet shows how Christianity could change the perspective. He saw in the same regularity the sign of the mere creaturehood of the stars. Even the stars have to obey. <laughs> this is typical of that revolution which took place. Infinity had an inferior connotation among the old Greeks, indefiniteness. It changed already a little in Plotinus. Plotinus had also a positive view of infinity, but he may have undergone some Christian influence uh, also in, in his age. Now with the Christian thinkers, it becomes the attribute of God in a positive way. This is typical. God's power, free power, is stressed. And therefore, the theme of possibilities offered to God becomes distinct. You see? For our reflection on possibility, this is the new thing that appears. To God, all things are possible. This encourages the expectation of miracles, but it may also be the springboard of speculation. And even later, of medieval conundrums of the kind, can God create a ball that's too big for him to move? You see, this reflection on possibility uh, uh, triggered such uh, ways of, of raising questions. There is at least a clear affirmation that the field of the possible is greater than the field of the real or actual. Because, because of God's 
almighty freedom. Augustine then applies to the creature in God's image the same emphasis on freedom. Man in creation was gifted with free will. Of course, already before Augustine, Origen and others had also stressed this free will. But before a human person, there are several possibilities. This is implied by that free will, uh, a part of God's image. Gulven Madek, a foremost uh, August, uh, Augustine expert, makes the important remark that free will for young Augustine is not uh, the choice between good and evil, but between higher and lesser good. This is uh, his definition in the first work on, on free will. But since he also defines sin, Augustine, as not the appetite or desire for things evil, but the desertion of things better, then we can say evil is definitely implied in this notion of free will. And in his later discussions of the original state of humankind, he does include the possibility uh, of disobedience within his definition uh, of free will. Posse peccare can sin, and posse non peccare and can not sin, can separate, <laughs> not sin, able not to sin. Uh, this is his description of the situation of Adam in the garden. And he says it even to the end of his career uh, in the book De Corruptione et Gratia. Uh, corruptione, not corrupt. <laughs> it's of correction and grace. He says it very, very clearly. I'm not sure that he was able entirely to clarify the relationship between this possibility, as he expresses it, and the sovereignty of God, uh, which he also stressed so powerfully, and which should encompass uh, free will. Some people thought that he changed position. Uh, I think this is less probable, uh, but that there was a tension and some unclarity uh, I would uh, grant uh, in uh, Augustine's uh, own position. A, a residue of Neoplatonism is, however, manifest in his interpretation of ex nihilo, which I already mentioned. And uh, I didn't say that he once called non-being quasi-matter. It is in his work against Secundinum, a Manichaean uh, representative. He goes even to this point. You see the influence of uh, the Greek thinking b before him uh, on him. And he considers that uh, creature can, this is part of uh, its uh, inner possibility, uh, can tend towards non-being. Thomas Aquinas belongs to Augustine's posterity. And this must be stressed because we uh, remember that he baptized Aristotle. <laughs> uh, but we uh, should see that what he took from Aristotle was basically the anthropology and the epistemology. But that he kept uh, the theology of Augustine. <laughs> Augustine's God, uh, and uh, also to, to a large extent, his view of sin and grace. And as to the great uh, scheme uh, he follows in his theological sum, it is the Neoplatonic circle, circular movement, uh, proceeding from God and returning to God. Uh, this is the plan, the very plan, outline uh, of the theological sum. So he was also a Plotinian or uh, Neoplatonic thinker, often through uh, the uh, the, the mediation of pseudo-Dionysus, the Aropagaitis, 
so uh, there, all these elements are found together in Thomas Aquinas. He starts from, also from the absolute active power of God. And he stresses infinite power, although his successor will uh, emphasize infinity even much more than Thomas Aquinas. It is, it is present quite, quite heavily. And he defines the correlative possibilities for God as all things that are not contradictory, not contra contradictory in themselves, and that do not contradict uh, God's nature. This is the definition of possibility with great stress on God's active power. But he insists that this does not mean any real ontological uh, quasi-substance before God's decision and God's action. He is clear on this point. Uh, his intention is to avoid any substratum idea of that nothingness of which creatures proceed. But his idea of free will is the same as Augustine, and even more, maybe more stressed, uh, with the possibility of uh, either choice, yes uh, or no. And we saw already that he, he attaches to creaturehood a fallibility that inevitably uh, uh, goes into actualization, at least in some cases. Then Scotus, the subtle doctor, as it was his nickname in uh, his own days, uh, so subtle that the word dunce in English recalls the impression he made to many of his contemporaries, to some people, starts from possibility to prove God's existence. Possibility on a metaphysical level and according to logical criteria. He thinks it is a more rigorous way than starting with uh, the world as it is, contrary to Thomas Aquinas. So possibility acquires a, a new status and, and importance in Duns Scotus' view. He relishes, even more than Thomas, the notion of infinity. He insists on potentia in his sense of freedom. Uh, he distinguished between God's absolute power and God's ordained power once he has decided which course he, he would choose. One may also add, it is interesting, that he is careful not to include the possibilities of God's freedom within the divine essence. They are posterior to the use of the divine will, contrary to what we find in Thomas Aquinas. And contrary, I anticipate, I already said it, uh, to what we find in, in Leibniz. His main motive, Scotus, seems to have been to ward off all temptations of confusing God and the world. Voluntarism stresses the particular consistency of each actor, and Gilson suggests that Don Scotus was influenced by the condemnation by the Bishop of Paris in 1277 of a number of views. Some of them appear to be Thomas Aquinas. Uh, some statements that were taken from the writings of Thomas Aquinas, who, who was dead at that time. So uh, Scotus glorified possibility even beyond what had been done before him, and he is considered by many as a forerunner uh, of modernity in, in this emphasis on, on will uh, and possibility. Modernity, freedom and the bounds of reason. A new turn, which was not uh, effected overnight, it took about 200 years, but a new turn was taken in the Renaissance. The dawn of modernity, at least the first phase of modernity. 
A new ontological pair reshaped the worldview of most. Nature freedom, to use the formula which Doyovet considers as the most adequate. We could also say science and self, or science and subject, in the modern sense of subject. Do I bypass reformation? I agree that there were deep and effective ties between Renaissance and Reformation, at least for a moment. They, there was a solidarity in the first uh, phase of it. The Reformation participated powerfully in the issuing of modernity. The Reformation also fostered the sense of the individual subject. Yet, Another Augustinian element weighed so heavily for the reformers, the sense of sin and the sense of grace, that I find practically no specific reflection on possibility in their writings. And this is why I concentrate today on the Renaissance and the modernity that proceeds from Renaissance. What is new on the Renaissance side is an enthusiastic conviction of human freedom as unlimited. Before the human subject lies an immense field of pure possibility. It is open for human endeavor to conquer. Count Pico della Mirandola, who died very early in life, probably poisoned. Pico della Mirandola, who was already famous in his age, wrote a book of all things noble. <laughs> Voltaire added jo jokingly, and a few others. <laughs> he wrote of the, uh, the incredible versatility of human uh, mind and, and genius. He praises the divine generosity in the opening part of his discourse on human dignity. He exclaims, to man is given to possess what he chooses, to be what he wants to be. Who would not admire this chameleon that we are? <laughs> this new sense of freedom as entirely open with full possibilities. The only partner of such a freedom is the rational order of nature. This order was better and better known through the fantastic progress of mathematics. In the first phase, the marriage between that mathematical reason and freedom was a happy marriage, for reason was the weapon of the conquest of the field of possibilities. But since the rational uh, work of scientists uh, establishes uh, a deterministic view uh, of the world. Gradually, it changed into a threat for freedom. Does not the scientific picture of the real rule out possibility? This, what more than more, the burning question. Leon Brunswick wrote, the universe of a science which refuses to let itself be carried away into the shadows of virtuality, possibility, uh, which sets everything in act, in the light. This is the characteristic of the new science and the problem of modernity. Let's see a few of the stages, René Descartes towers above the first modernity. His rationalism is well known, guaranteed by his great discoveries in mathematics. Uh, he, he is the founder of analytic geometry. Uh, but his voluntarism is less conspicuous, yet I think it may be deeper in his thought. Whereas rational powers of man, 
are finite, he said, will is infinite. And this explains error. In error, the will goes beyond what is intelligently known. And this, which he applies to the human will, he also applies to the divine will. He breaks with tradition and he makes the innate ideas through which we think the truth of reasons the result of God's free volition. God could have decided otherwise. The basic truth, in, including the principle of non-contradiction. He clearly, in the letter to Father Melo, uh, said that God could have decided otherwise than the principle of contradiction. So this is extremely significant. You see divine possibility. Descartes' successors, whose mind had been set on fire by his promotion of the new scientific reason, could not stomach this rebirth of extreme nominalism. <laughs> Spinoza, in the interest of reason unfolding its logic, denounced the possibility as an optical illusion. It, it is merely uh, the uh, subjective uh, impression of our ignorance. And so he dismissed the idea, especially in a letter, letter 19, to Breinberg. Leibniz, a major landmark in our exploration, did feel the force of the Spinozistic temptation. He says so himself. But According to his own confession, he was able to extricate itself from the seductive bonds of that uh, ultimate rationalism. His great mathematical discovery, infinitesimal calculus, enabled him to find his way out of the two labyrinths, he said, uh, that afflict the human mind. Uh, the problem, first labyrinth, uh, of continuity and divisibility of space and the problem of divine providence and human freedom. In both cases, infinitesimal calculus provided an issue, he thought. Possibility is, first of all, the characteristic of all the essences in God's mind, belonging as such to God's essence, an infinity, an infinity of possible worlds. All these possible worlds, whose definition does not depend on God's will, include metaphysical evil with physical and moral evil entailed. Uh, God, who is perfectly good, chose into existence the best of those possible worlds, but he had not any freedom to uh, change the constitution of any of these worlds, uh, which necessarily included the possibility of evil. This was characteristic of these possibilities, according to uh, Leibniz. These possibilities are only limited by the principle of contradiction. All non-contradictory uh, things are possible and are prior to God's decree in God's mind. Regarding human free will, he uh, dismissed with very strong terms, although he was always courteous, he, he had strong uh, uh, statements. Uh, Pelagian free will, the liberty of indifference, uh, with the uncertainty about the decision, decision to make, this, he said, is, is empty, silly representation. But he maintained free will. He said it is not necessity. Uh, the will is inclined by a multitude of factors. And God, knowing the infinity of factors, knows the result with certainty. <laughs> but. Uh, it is free, it is not necessity, because these factors incline only. And this includes Judas' betrayal, 
as part of the uh, essence of Judas within the possible world in which he is found. This is Leibniz's thesis. I venture the interpretation that Leibniz's chief intention was ironic. It was a great project of his life to reconcile uh, those who had been opposed. He thought with help of mathematics that he could reconcile contrary philosophies and theologies. But there were reactions already in his time. The leader of the Jansenist party, with whom he had a long uh, correspondence, uh, had reservations, and many others. André de Muralt, in the Review of Theology and Philosophy, says, well, this remains necessity. <laughs> uh, he tries to maintain that it is not necessity, but it's so nearly so that uh, we have to say that he does not really escape it. And this is also a conclusion which Dr. Lydia Yeager, a colleague and friend of mine, also has uh, well uh, discerned in Leibniz. Uh, uh, his contingency is an appearance of contingency, but not truly so. Tuyo Wirt, I mentioned, is especially penetrating in his long critique. His, is one of the longer critiques in his new critique of theoretical thought, uh, volume one. He devotes a large amount of space to Leibniz with many, many quotations, and he's extremely severe. He concludes that the idea of God uh, is only the final hypothesis of creative mathematical thought for Leibniz. And cons uh, considering possible words, uh, he says he says it about Scheller, Max Scheller, but uh, he states that Scheller got the idea from Leibniz. The idea of the possible worlds is meaningless. This is Dovier's opinion, because we cannot speak of the cosmos except in its temporal horizon, fixed in the divine order of the creation. And this, I think, is the thought we may keep in mind. We may observe in, in Leibniz that the possibilities which only obey the principle of non-contradiction, which is a logical criterion, still, according to some of his sentences, acquire a degree of reality. For he described these possible worlds, these pure possibilities, as vying with one another towards existence. <laughs> so he does give them a, an element, a weight of reality. Schelling was a critic of Leibniz, as I already said, uh, but in his case, the reflection of possibility is engulfed by the passion of the Urgrund, Urgrund uh, and so I am not stopping at this, at this station. I moved to Kierkegaard, who followed the lessons, the lectures, uh, of the old Schelling in Berlin. Uh, Kierkegaard was uh, at that moment a, a student of, of Schelling. Possibility is a key category for Kierkegaard. We find reflections in the philosophical fragments, Okrams, uh, in the postscript, a very definitive uh, postscript, but for us, most importantly, in his two books on evil sin, the concept of angst, dread, anxiety, and sickness unto death. With Kierkegaard, we find an altogether different uh, situation. Uh, he no longer deals with possibility in the way uh, the scholastics have, and Leibniz, and, and, and Descartes, and so on. Uh, his viewpoint is anthropological is existential. It is starting from uh, the throes of life and the decision to make uh, that he speaks of uh, possibility. But as such, possibility is vital for him. He says we, we cannot live without a mixture. The two are necessary. What is necess necessity and uh, possibility? 
possibility is just as the vowels, we need to pronounce the consonants <laughs> of necessity. Uh, or also, it is uh, as the oxygen we need uh, to breathe. Uh, this is possibility. But possibility is always mixed. Uh, it is characteristic of freedom, but with another characteristic which is interesting to note, it has a link with logic, with rational thinking. Rational thinking deals with possibilities. And it has to negate possibility to enter into actuality through decision. <laughs> this is a negation of possibility uh, in the moment of decision. You play with ideas, you see. This is the realm of possibilities. Uh, but you have to go to reality to involve, imply, uh, commit yourself in decision. This is characteristic. But since he affirms this freedom that is to make decision uh, as a, an infinite freedom, possibility uh, is an abyss. And freedom looking in, into its own abyss uh, generates anxiety, dread, angst. Uh, and this is the preparation, though there is always a leap, uh, this is the preparation for sin uh, in his analysis. Last section, which survey, some new comments from the, the last century, possible and nothingness. Late and very late hours, modernity. I don't say postmodernity because I think it is a tricky uh, label. If it suggests, and so it does for many, uh, that a new age has dawned, that modernity is past, I think it is deceptive. It is rather still modernity, Modernity all decaying, rotting, and reversing some of its tendencies according to its inner contradictions. But it is still modernity. This is why I rather say late modernity. Late modernity looks as if it has reached the end of the road, the road of freedoms, triumph, and crisis, and conversions. I can predict how long the end will be. There may be still refurbishings of modernity for quite, quite a time. What have been the factors of this last evolution? First, probably the fantastic development of human power over nature, including its demographic consequences. This has changed the relationship with the pre-given order of nature. There have been the traumas of war and genocide, Shoah, Holocaust, and Gulag. Also, the growth of the sciences that have acquired a new standing but revealed disquieting depth, the abyss of psychoanalytical unconscious, the abyss of counterintuitive physics, who can understand quanta physics, quanta theory? <laughs> All this has contributed to uh, a sense of uncertainty. One could add the changes in mores. And what is most typical of our age, not only a change in mores, but in morals, <laughs> in the morals that are accepted. Also, the unsolved debates on the epistemological foundations of the scientific enterprise, uh, the links which may or may not have uh, with ethical debates. In this situation, possibility is understood as an open future for individual freedom become absolute and for society. And it is both a thrill and a th threat. But there are many people also who abandon any thought of meaningful possibility and say no future. 
I mentioned Bergson's critique of the idea of possibility. He unmasked as a mirage uh, the usual inference, if it happened, then it was before that possible. He says, no, this is a sophistry. It corresponds really to the retro projection of our imagination. We may note, in addition, a, an interesting distinction he makes. He distinguishes merely logical possibility as non-impossibility without any reality involved and real possibility. He says organic possibility, that is his phrase, which corresponds to a present actual reality, the germ of seed of what will later become visible. And again, it's an idea of possibility we have to keep in mind. Jean-Paul Sartre was probably one of the most typical and influential thinkers of the Western world uh, in the 20th century, and freedom was his absolute. His original contribution was the association of freedom with nothingness. And you know his title, being and nothingness. To exercise freedom is to bore a hole in the compact, stupid, nauseous mass of being. This is his key intuition. And in an interesting passage of being in nothingness, he aptly criticizes Leibniz. And he denounces Aristotle's ambiguous, deceptive ascription of reality to potentiality, saying it is a magical conception. That's the word Sartre used. In his perspective, what we call possible only derives pro from the pro projective move of our freedom and its annihilation. The French word he uses, néantisation. I don't know if you have another equivalent in English, but annihilation of being. So you see, from Aristotle to Sartre, you get an idea of the diversity of human proposals. And in the next session, we shall try to bring some biblical light over that diversity. <laughs>